hip hop takeover now on BBC4. The final double bill of the songs that shook America. In 40 minutes, the misogynistic music world of the late 80s is rocked by Queen Latifah. But first, back to 1986 and an epic rap battle with strong language and discriminatory language, which some may find offensive. <laughs> Battle record is a staple in hip hop. Rap was like sports. You went out to win the championship. I'm gonna float like a butterfly and sing like a bee. Being number one or being on top of the game, guys gonna disrespect you. It's all gloves off. There are no rules. A battle rap can change an artist's career, positive or negative. It's resulted in death, as we've seen with Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac. Those legendary battles between Jay Z and Nas, NWA, Ice Cube, Meek Mill, Drake was personal. That is the blueprint, and it was started by the Bridge Wars. The Bridge Wars started a battle revolution. You love to hear the story again and again of how it all got started way back when. And MC Shag representing Queensbridge, and we was representing the Bronx. My hood now has an anthem that everybody got to deal with it. Like, deal with it. People discovered you can use your words as weapons. There is a war, and the war is your career. now called the bridge wars it was really the borough wars back then like you know straight bronx queens and if staten island or brooklyn or harlem want to jump in pick a side <laughs> so there's bronx and there's queens and there's two different crews from the bronx there's boogie down productions which is krs1 scott larock and d nice and then you have Queens, Molly Mall, Shan, and the Juice Crew. Shan and Molly were street, but they had money and they had fame. So they were the big boys on the block. Karis One and, and Scott LaRock were the underdogs. It was an epic battle. To really understand how the Bridge Wars got started, you have to go back to how rap was viewed at the time. Because in 1986, White radio and black radio really didn't want to play hip hop. They almost called it nigger music, you know, like street music, like it wasn't any good. Like this was a fad, it's not gonna last. Hip hop is not gonna happen. B S. Good evening to your super listeners. How you doing tonight, all your fly guys and fly girls? Welcome once again to the world famous Mr. Magic Rapper Jack. And of course, I am Sir Juice. Mr. Magic was hip hop's Moses on radio, you know. He was the first guy who had enough juice and confidence and belief in the culture and the music to actually play the music on the radio. And then he had his engineer, all-star Molly Maul, putting on the mixing gloves. When Mr. Magic and Molly Maul were on the radio and they had the show called The Rapper's Hat, it was the time when the streets were completely quiet. People would try to base their parties around having The Rapper's Hat during the whole time. Don't forget you can experience the world famous Mr. Magic Rap Attack live with Molly Ma on the Wheels of Steel. We wrote the book for Hip Hop Radio. We was the first commercial rap show in history. I used to tape songs and you'd sit there waiting all day long just for a show to come on to catch that one hot song. You know, Goosebumps or Pimples, I don't know which one is right, but we used to get them. You know, he was the first hip-hop guy to get on a major radio station. 98.7 KISS FM saw it. They were like, okay, we need to counteract this. And they brought in cool DJ Red Alert. And Red Alert and Mr. Magic were gods on the radio. And they battled. DJ Red Alert. Tell you the truth, not being cocky about it, I know I was always paying attention to what he was doing, but once I got more involved with what I was doing, I didn't pay attention about him no more. One from the treble, two from the bass. Come on, Molly Ball, let's rock three states. Every weekend, it's like going back and forth on the dial. Who's doing what? Who's doing what? So we needed ammo. I wasn't trying to be a record producer. I was trying to be the best DJ. And by trying to be the best DJ, I would have to produce these little gems, which became these big records in hip-hop. Roxanne's Revenge was never supposed to be a record. That was just something I was using on Mr. Magic's show to have something different. 
The bridge actually wasn't meant to be a record. When we made that song, we talking about our neighborhood, how we caught the hip hop bug. We didn't intend for it to be the first record that represented the hood. We were making it for us, actually. Ladies and gentlemen, we got MC Sam and Molly Marl in the house tonight. They just came from up tour. They want to tell you a little story about where they come from. The when we made that song. That was QB Pride. Queensbridge is directly across from Manhattan on the 59th Street Bridge. A family oriented spot back in the day. Queensbridge is the largest housing project in the world. There's 15,000 tenants. It wasn't like being in just a project, it was like being in a little city. They used to have like the chess boards on the block. They would go battle and put the money on the chess board. Whoever wins, swipe the chess board with the money. Shan used to be out there. We were just rapping on the benches. This is what we did. We came outside in the morning looking to battle each other all day. The rap battle was built upon the foundation of the dozens, young people wanting to challenge each other to determine who's the alpha. We live in communities where we walk around, sometimes literally, with body armor. And the dozens is about challenging your opponent with words, being able to strip away those layers of armor. Every evening, there was a crowd over on 12th Street rhyming off the top of our head. We got really nice at it, too. I've known MC Shan my entire life. He was my first battle rap partner. We would sit on the bench and rhyme until the sun come up. See, right now we're on Vernon Boulevard, 41st and Vernon. This is my block. I lived in 4117. Those four windows on the sixth floor was mine. And this window faces Manhattan. What I used to do is blast music out the window. I just wanted to see people dance walking to the train station. His windows face the basketball court. In order to exit out the projects, you got to walk across the basketball court. So he knew what to play for who, when to play it. See, Molly's living room was different. He had the wall unit, which had equipment on it, turntables over here, a reel of reel here, and a four track cassette over there. So it wasn't a living room, it was a studio. When Shantae made her record, that changed the whole game. We was doing this to have fun. Oh, you can get a check too. I did a six minute freestyle and went and continued doing my laundry. And then within a week, I had record companies calling me for a deal. Shantae did it, I gotta do it. I said, I gotta write a song about the DJ. Cause that's what MCs were in the beginning. They were the DJ's mouthpiece. I wrote Molly Scratch on a paper bag and I went and seen Molly with it. He took my name, Molly Marl, and broke it down. Now, I had an MC whose voice was an instrument. Next thing you know, we got shows together. It was Marley Marl, MC Shan. I was just going out on shows with Shantae, building up a name for myself. And I said to Shan, I said, you know, we should make an intermission song for tomorrow's show in the park, the Queensbridge Day. Queensbridge Day is a day when everybody from Queensbridge, everyone who's lived in Queensbridge, we all meet inside of River Park. Everybody brings out their barbecues, brings out their families. Molly said, yo, let's make a song about the bridge. And I took out an envelope and I started jotting and we just made the song. This is a place where stars are born. We are the only ones that can't be worn out. Find a place in part of the world. While I'm out on tour, keep your hands up a girl while she's in. The bridge. The bridge. The bridge. The bridge. Now, the first time we played the bridge, Bands got finished and we just threw it on. It was crazy once it come on. Da, 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 do, da, 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 do, da. Later on, it was like, ladies and gentlemen, we got MC Shan and Molly Marl and I it was like, oh my God. It's like y'all ain't know about my hood before. That song changed everything. We just had an open door to radio, super rock and Mr. Magic. And now the bridge wars have begun. Even if Molly Maul doesn't know it yet, the history book was going to fucking change. Molly Maul and MC Shan's song, The Bridge, was revolutionary. Not just for the battle that set it off, but really for the way that it was made. 
it set hip hop onto a whole new sonic trajectory. I used to work for Aaron Fuchs and he gave me a box of 45s. And in those 45s, one of them happened to be Impeach the President. Every time I used to play Impeach the President, Pandemonium. If I could use the songs that get the reaction in my sampler to make music, that's going to be the game changer. Impeach the President is an understood b-boy national anthem song. Impeach the President is hip-hop's heartbeat. I mean, the basic break. You freestyle on a lunchroom table and you bring out a beat. And a hip-hop cypher. That's the beat you do. Molly sampled Impeach the President for the bridge. It wasn't hours and hours of sampling time like it is now. This sampler right here created the bridge, this Korg sampler, with one second of sampling. So I was able to get a kick, a snare, and a hi-hat. What he winds up doing is, is one of the first examples of what hip-hop producers like to call chopping, where you don't sample just the exact four measures of a brick. You splice it up, and you microtrop it, and then you flip it, and EQ it with different frequencies to give it more impact. But because he can't save these sounds on his computer because the technology isn't out yet, he sort of has to take the scenic route, saving it on a half inch reel. So when his session is done, he has to sit there and literally have a space, save his kick, save his kick in his hi-hat, and then save his snare. That will preserve all of his drum samples. I made the intro start like this. That was the gunshots we used to hear at nighttime echoing from the other blocks. We played the bridge a lot. My friends and I would have endless conversations about what is that. You couldn't play it on a guitar, you couldn't play it on a piano, you couldn't play it on horns, you couldn't play it on drums. That's actually the magic disco machine scratching horns going backwards. And the bridge used to talk to us. Cars going across the bridge. The record became a phenomenon because the whole hood is running around with the bridge tape. The bridge was a hit. The bridge started to really dominate. Make this here one jam that you do not start no fight. Cause that is one thing that we all must see done. And if you start some shit, your ass had better to run. And then BDP South Bronx comes out. So you think that hip hop had this start out in Queensbridge? If you pop that junk up in the Bronx, you might not live. Cause you're in South Bronx, the South South Bronx, the South Bronx, the South Bronx. The South, South Bronx. It was the sucker punch out of nowhere. South, South Who's trying to take out Marley and MC Shan and why? We have the BDP group which consisted of DJ Scott LaRock, Karis One, and myself, D-Nice. I was like 14 years old at the time. Scott and Chris started BDP around 1985. At that time, Scott was working up at the shelter with Chris. Most of the people you see inside shelters are usually, you know, they're there because of the bottle, the crack, the, the needle, the whatever it is, they're there for a reason. We were there simply because we, no one else would believe in us. Family-wise, no one believed in our music. No one would ever dream. You know, you tell somebody, tell your mother you want to make a rap record. He's, oh no, you're bugging. You know, get your butt in school and you know so on. So you know, I, I, I left home at a very young age. Where I was like 13, going on 14. He moved to the Bronx. I don't know how he got to the Bronx from Brooklyn because we was entrenched in Brooklyn. KRS One lived at the Franklin Men's Shelter in the Bronx. Scott LaRock was working there. Scott LaRock was also a club DJ who had a lot of connections in the area, but he didn't have an MC. Chris, at that time, was a young graffiti artist. It was just wild, running around tagging up, and then every so often he'd be like, I rhyme too. Growing up in the Bronx, I was uh, 15 years old. We really didn't have a lot of money, so I cooked some food up and took it to the shelter for my cousin. And he said, hey, I want to introduce you to someone. 
introduced me to Scott LaRock and Scott looked at me and said, you're going to be in my group. Just like that. Those guys were in the studio making records for years. We uh, tried to make conscious music. We went everywhere trying to get a deal. Couldn't get a deal. Nobody could hear our sound. So we brought it to Mr. Magic. I was in the studio with Mr. Magic and Shantae. I believe Scott LaRock comes in. We're Boogie Down Production, you know, we're a crew. You know, we're in the next studio. We would love for you to come listen to our demo. And Magic's like, yo, Ma, call me to the next studio. They put on their music. All of a sudden, in the middle of the song, Mr. Magic goes over to the console. He just shuts it down. It's like, in the studio, it's like straight silent. He says, yo, that shit is garbage. Y'all want real hip hop? Roxanne Shante, Molly Mar, MC Shan, Mr. Magic, that's real hip hop. That shit is whack. Well, that was like a spear through my heart. We looked at Mr. Magic like, God, like, yo, Mr. Magic. Wow. He just dissed us. These were icons in the hip hop world. And Mr. Magic, he was so disrespectful to them, but KRS's attitude is, I'm not whack. Your MC Shan is whack. Mr. Magic turns around and just walks out the room, leaves me there in the room full of goons. So, with me rushing to get out, I leave this by mistake in the studio. It's, it's like so crazy how it all, it's like all connected. These are my prized sampled drum sounds from back in the day that made all the hits. Eric B is president. Make the music with your mouth, bitch. The bridge. Legend has it that what Marley accidentally does is leave his tape reel of all the sample noises. And they see that tape reel, so they take it. And then Chris put in his mind to attacking MC Shan. Now, once Chris gets something in his mind focused, he's going all the way. We felt very disrespected at how he approached us. So I wrote a record dissing his whole organization, the Juice Crew. We put it out, South Bronx. As hard as it looked, as Wallace it seemed, I didn't hear a peep from a place called Queens. The crazy thing, when I first heard South Bronx, I didn't think nobody would believe them. The hood got flipped around. It was crazy to me. So it was like he was representing Queensbridge. And we was representing the Bronx. Chris said, I'm coming out with a new song called South Bronx, and Red Alert is going to play it Friday night. And I said, you know Red Alert? Last time I spoke to you, you was running around homeless, and now you know Red Alert. But Scott LaRock was a DJ with a lot of connections in the area. He knew Red Alert from the Bronx. Red Alert was God. I used to listen to Red Alert every single week, religiously, like everybody else in New York City. If your record was on Red Alert, you was a star. Well, much respect to Scott LaRock, rest in peace. Scott LaRock and I was good friends before I got to meet Chaos One. Scott gave me the South Bronx record. Okay, yes, I can go ahead and break this on the radio. Red Alert took pride in launching this record. Oh, I was getting a great reaction from the audience once I played Back to Back, The Bridge, and then South Bronx. Especially people who taped it. Ladies and gentlemen, the sounds you're about to hear is from cool DJ Red Alert. Hey, that is started off like this. Cause you're in South Bronx, the South, South Bronx, South Bronx, the South, South Bronx. And I heard it and it was like, oh man, you know, wow, they are they hating. It's a diss record, but it's really like a Bronx anthem. He's talking about um, Cool Herc and um, Bam and, and B-Boys ran to the latest jam. When it got shot up, it went home and went, damn. Keras, he rewrote the book. Cool, DJ Red Alert and Chuck chill out on the mix. When Africa Islam was rocking the jams, on the other side of town was a kid named Flash. Patterson and Millbrook projects casting over all over. You couldn't stop it. The Cypress Boys, the real rock steady, taking out these toys. I don't know what part of Queens y'all fucking talking about, but this shit right here is where the shit was moving. South Bronx just sounded new. The horn stab. That's from James Brown's 1976 comeback song, Get Up Off That Thing. Just that one eighth of a second of a stab. 
That's the equivalent of 20 exclamation points. And its use is to announce defiance. What was weird is when the momentum for them started building. South Bronx gets on regular rotation on the radio on KISS FM, playing in the daytime. It's one thing to do a disc record, but when you make a hit disc record, it, it takes it to another level. My records speak for me. You know, when I say something violent, that's the statement I made. If you poke the bear the right way, you can get what you want. That's part of the game. It goes back to like boxing when you had these champions. Why do some guys get a shot? They just poke the bear the right way and they get the shot. KRS is a desperate man at that point. When South Bronx came out, he was homeless. He had nothing to lose. In the studios right now, we have Mr. DJ Scott LaRock and KRS One. What's up, much static going on between Mr. Magic, Molly Mall, MC Shan, and the Boogie Down production? We'd like to know. Let us know what's happening. Magic got a serious problem. He has an identity crisis. He continues to run his mouth. Me and my crew are not going for it no more. That's it. He tried to diss us one night in the studio a couple months ago. I said, yo, Chris, let's put out this regular let's diss him. We dissed him, that's it. You dissed him very hard. So, Mr. KRS-One, what is your side of this? Okay, bust this, right? Mm -hmm. There's one line in the bridge that says, the monument for hip-hop is right in your face. Mm -hmm. Sit and listen for a while to the name of the place, the bridge, the bridge, the bridge. Mm -hmm. That lie possessed us to do South Bronx. Mm -hmm. When you say monument, mm -hmm. I mean, think of a monument for hip-hop. It's right. not Queens. I was like, yo, what? What the fuck they got in him? Trying to, like, tear our shit down and we the hottest shit out. We killing them out here. Yo, you know what's so funny about it, P-Fine? It's like Boogie Down Production used to come to me with tapes back in the day, right? And, like, this whole thing is because, you know, magic went off on them, so this, they think they could get back at us. All I can say is about the Boogie Down, yo, y'all going about it the wrong way. If I'm one of those that I'm battling everybody, Molly already knew where my mind was when it came to it. You gonna get this dude. South Bronx, kill a kill that noise. South Bronx, kill a kill that noise. 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 I'm listening to Molly Mall and I hear MC Shan kill that noise. Shan is like these dudes trying to get hot off me. Even with South Bronx being a hit, they still weren't bigger than shit. South Bronx, kill that noise, South Bronx. And I'm like, wow, the beat is nice. And Shan just has so much class and pizzazz with the way J.U. Ice is what I'm claiming. And it's self-explaining. I don't really mind being criticized because those who try to make fame off my name die. We thought Shan got this battle covered. People from the bridge, they were waiting for Shan to kill something they were just waiting for the kill but it is notable that mc shan does call them out for the real reason why this battle exists in the first place yo shan i didn't hear you say hip-hop started in the bridge in your record i didn't they wanted to get on the bandwagon when i first heard south bronx i didn't think nobody would believe them to be honest i'm like man, anybody gonna believe them clowns man because we never said that hip-hop started in queensbridge on the record when I heard Kill That Noise, I was scared for Chris. You're on them niggas' radar, and they're on you. So it was hush mouth for Bronx short for a little minute, because we didn't know how that was going to play out. Like, you know, Molly's powerful. A few weeks later, we heard this record called South Bronx Kill That Noise by MC Shan. And the battle was on. I have a very competitive nature. You know, I love to be in the thick of the battle. Uh, so I put out this record called The Bridge Is Over. I saw Chris and I said, I told you not to mess with Shan. I told you. And he was like, I already got an answer. I already got a song for it. I already got a song. When Shan may kill that noise, it was like, it's about time because we thought he was a coward. So we had to respond right away. That's how it was. You didn't wait weeks to respond to this stuff back then. You know, everything was urgent. First, everybody was down because the engineer told us we couldn't do it. He's like, we got a session coming in. So it became a scramble for them. Chris ran into the vocal booth to rehearse the piano because he played the piano live. This guy was like, yo, what, what you gonna do? I said, no, 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 I got this guy, I got this, I got this. And I put up my impeach the president samples, 
put the beat in. Boom, boom. Ah, ah. Then I put the fills in. You know, the boom, 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 boom. you know. Then Chris came out. He was like, and he said, "I'm ready." He did the vocal in one take. It wasn't no time to mess up nothing. We knocked it out in less than 45 minutes. Look at that closely. There would be no bridges over if my drum reel was never lost. I don't know what happened to my drum reel. One day I go on power play like three months later, and my drum reel sitting on the manager's desk. I'm like, yo, what's this doing here? So you left this here. The engineer started telling me stories about how my reel was floating around. He's like, yeah, and bridges over. That's your drum sounds from your reel you left. They were saying they took his reel from power play. I didn't need any sounds from Molly Bart, but all of those sounds came from those great old bands. Everybody had a copy of Piece of President. For the bridges over, Red was ready to play the acetate as soon as we did it. An acetate looked like a vinyl record, but you only had a certain amount of time you can play it. I saw older dudes in the neighborhood gather around a radio to play the bridges over. So I didn't want to get near them, you know, there's some dangerous cats, you know, I didn't want to get too close. They tell me, smack me in my head, tell me, get out of here. And I was just so excited to say I heard it. You know what I'm saying? More than even analyzing the song, I was just so excited to say I heard the answer. The piano was real sinister. Just the melody alone had a little hint of, of, of Jamaica in it. That had already made it dangerous. And at the time, Jamaicans was running real tough in New York. It always comes under Boogie Down Productions, but KRS-One was a Brooklyn sound because it had the reggae vibes, it was bass heavy. His music was, was, was sounded like I was walking through the streets of Flatbush. And that's where he grew up. At this point, Flatbush, Brooklyn, was becoming very West Indian. So there was a lot of like reggae music around. In battles with sound systems, that's something that's always been part of the reggae scene from Jamaica. And they brought that to New York. In the Bronx, you would be battling a sound from Brooklyn. So this was nothing new to for KRS-One. I said, the bridge is over, the bridge is over. Bye-bye. Taking Boops by Supercat, redoing the bass line. It's kind of a mashup between dancehall, reggae culture, and hip-hop. Nobody played reggae in a hip-hop club. None. KRS-One comes in a hip-hop club with a reggae beat and starts chatting reggae. Toasting is what they called the Jamaican version of, of rap at the time. KRS-One started modeling some of his phrases and melodies after the most iconic toasters. Here's an example of KRS-1 Then wish the battle BDP but they cannot Then must be on the jock of DJ Scott LaRock Cause we don't complain Nor do we play the game of favors Boogie Down Production comes in three different flavors Pick any tip for the flavor that you savor And Mr. Magic might wish to come and try to save you But instead that help you out, he want the same thing I gave yeah. you I finally figured it out, a magic mouth is used for sucking Roxanne Chate is only good for steady popping MC Shannon Molly Mall is really only blocking. Like Dougie Fresh said, I tell you now you ain't nothing. nothing. Compared to Red Alert, don't get seven down, 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 down. down. Before the bridge is over, no one said people's names in a rhyme. No one really even cursed on a record. Yeah, you're ready. I remember Video Music Box going to the Fever on Webster Ave and KRS-One gets on stage and he does the bridges over and the place goes wild. Drinks are flying, people are bumping into you. Nobody cared. It was like the Yankees won the World Series. It just felt authentic. Now it's not just a sham thing. It's the whole bridge. Forget about just the Queens bridge. It was Queens. And I was like, what's going to happen? We, <laughs> we need to have a meeting. It was just a good record. Even if you were from Queens, you were like, yo, that was dope. Say, man, it keeps on making it. Brooklyn keeps on taking it. Queens keep on faking it. Yeah. And all the Queens is like this. <laughs> Everybody dancing to a record as they get disrespected. You know, because the record was hot. I'm from Queens, man. It was hard to like that shit, but I liked it. Whoa. That was like thunder, lightning, tornado, earthquake. That was cataclysmic. There was now BDP fans in Queensbridge. <laughs> so the bridge was a hit. Before I left to London, 
I was over there for so long that when I came back, the wars had started. The limousine driver pulled up and told me like, oh yeah, you've been gone for a while. And I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, I got something you need to hear. And he played dun 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 dun. I was like, well, what the fuck is this? It went from the bridge to the bridge is over. Molly was like, he's getting famous off our back. But in my mind, it's like he dissed me. What do you mean he's getting famous? He dissed me, yo. The bridge is over is when the final loss was distributed. And that's it. There's nothing after that. The bridge is over was hardcore. It was like Chris had his foot on Shan's throat. Like, this is over. It's over. That was straight up B-boy, man. The people decided that they didn't want to hear Shan anymore. And they wanted to hear this new kid, KRS-One. All the things I was doing to change hip-hop, y'all believed the lie over the truth. So it made me step back a little, like, do I really want to do this? When it was came time for me to make another record about this situation, Molly said, no, I don't want to make another record about him because it's going to make him famous. But Molly, he's already famous. Now I don't want to do another song about him. And him being my producer, it is what it is. I didn't want to make records no more. I didn't want to make hip hop records. I didn't want to do it no more. I was like, come on, man. This is what y'all giving back to me? Yo, the bridge is over, got a funky beat. I like it. You know, if they wasn't talking about me, I would be hooking it up. But they're coming into the business with the wrong ambition. They don't know nothing about the business. And this goes out to Boogie Down, Red Alert, all other DJs that want to try to diss me. I'm going to be in radio for a while, and you will never know when I be your boss. Yo, Shani, we have war. And I was like, okay. I felt like, listen, chuck that up. The worst part of that record was said about me, and I'm the only girl in the crew. I bumped into Karis one at a bank. I had my son on my hip. I was like, hold a baby. And I ran right up to him. I expected him to be the bridge is over, the bridge, you know what I'm saying? And he was such a gentleman. But you know, he has this charismatic smile and he bobs his head from side to side. And he was so apologetic. Then he started asking me questions that didn't have shit to do with the argument. He was like, how's your son? And I was like, he's, no, man, don't ask me about my son. Like, you know, like I want to stay angry. Molly felt like I'm putting on a radio. They didn't have to come at me like that. You know, you Molly Mall. The thing about being one of the greats is that people are going to come for you. And if they never came for you, then that means you never was great. So I was like, you know, let me just, let me move forward with my technology. I'm a dope producer. I saw other talent coming up. The one crazy thing about the whole bridge war was that it was always only on wax. But one day, when Boogie Down Productions was the hottest thing in New York, Karis One had a show in Latin Quarters. A few of us were outside. And I saw Shan across the street. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, it's on. I don't know who he's with, but this is the final showdown. We're about to be out here fighting in front of Latin Quarters. This is it. Shan comes across the street. He looks at Chris and he goes, Chris, what's up? And put his hands out like that. I could not believe it. I would have fought Chris every time I saw him. It wasn't a thing, oh, I was scared of Chris or none of that. Come on, picture that. But look at how hip hop was. You never seen fights in the park. There was plenty of times I had to go back and get my pen. If you go back and come back tomorrow, the way me and Chris was rolling, see, a lot of people don't know, we did shows all over the place. We developed a friendship because we learned early in this game that if we fighting, we ain't gonna make no money. We was getting money. Sam was doing shows with BDP. Sam was doing commercials. Sound the alarm and the book the book the brick said spice the palm. Blowing up the spot like I was nitro gliss. And who's supposed to knock me out position? Chris? My next steps was like, yo, I'm not fucking with them. I'm not fucking with no BDP. I'm not doing no shows. I took it serious. The producer, he is the main man when it comes to making them beats. And at that point, if your producer didn't make the beats for you, you didn't make a record. At that point, it was Marley Mar, MC Sham. But then, you know, I had to, I had the bridges over. You know, we just stopped making records together. 
That's the funny thing about battle rap. I mean, it's all gloves off. There are no rules. There is a war. And the war is your career. After that, if I could produce this music, I have to be putting shit out the park. The bridge is over a day. It's like we can't get a break. So now everybody, ah, how the, where you from? Off from Queensbridge. Ah, the bridge is over. The morale went down in the hood. It had to go down. But if we didn't have the bridge wars back in the day, maybe that fire wouldn't have been set. The world around us was saying hip hop wasn't an art form. We were just getting dissed by all genres of music. And when this battle came, it just took hip hop and gave it a new insurgence. It's been 30 years, but the influence of that song is so wide ranging that it's, it's a staple. A battle record is a staple in hip hop. Battles definitely became more aggressive after the Bridge Wars. Ice Cube going at the NWA, no Vaseline. Boom, boom, boom. Trying to pick each member off. Tupac versus Biggie. Pac did take a blueprint from the Bridge Wars. Or hit him up, the first thing Pac say. That's why I F your wife. Jay-Z and Nas was personal. Ether was Nas's Bridges over. And to see them walk out on stage together, I don't know how you swallow that pill. Fast forward to Drake Meek Mill. I want the whole city to feel it. I want the whole world to feel it. The social media on top of the battle makes it a little bit more brutal. You could lose before your song comes out. There is an action and a reaction. Your reaction gotta be quick in this game. That's hip hop. That was written 30 years ago. This right here is from the Puma stuff. This is Puma. This is an old magazine. Old picture of Shan. <laughs> and this one right here is when me and Chris did the Sprite commercial. This is an original Polaroid from the day we did the shoot. I've been raising my children. That's what I do. This is what I am. I'm a better father than I am anything. After the Bridge Wars, my first project that I ever produced, I did Snow's Informer. But the bridge, that's my hit. If Molly didn't make that record, we wouldn't be in history right now. What's up? It's the Weekend Ritual. It's on. It's your boy DJ Legend, a.k.a. Molly Mall. Me and Karis one got cool later on in life. One day I read his bio and I realized that was the kids that magic dissed. Yo, your shit is garbage. Molly, I gotta say, first of all, you are the reason KRS One exists. For the sport of hip hop, I oughta did the same shit. The legacy for Molly Mall is incredible, undying, will never be touched. I can't even put in words all the things that he has done for hip hop through his ideas, through his creations. He does not get the attention that he should. The Molly Maul remix of Eric B for President, that whole first Biz album, Gone Girl, he was the first to use that James Brown break. The symphony single-handedly made me want a rope chain. Straight up. I was witness the first sample in hip hop to ever be taken. Molly took that whole idea to a whole nother level. He's one of the illest. Still. Shan made an absolute classic with the bridge. You listen to the bridge right now, you still gonna rock to it. That was QB Pride. That was something that we was putting on our back. We didn't intend for it to be the first record that represented the hood. We were making it for us, actually. We told our story to the world. Look at the seeds that grew from that battle. It was a legacy of people that lived in Queensbridge and Queens, period. Look at the strength that those battles gave Queens. My 
my strength for Queensbridge was watching Manhattan across the river and striving to get over there. I wanted to get over there to where the lights was at. And in the final edition, Ladies First, Queen Latifah's story next on BBC4. Six Music's artist in residence, Arlo Parks, has a mixtape of music that's changed her life. Download BBC Sounds to listen.